Uh, it's good to be with you, and I understand I'm with Creekside as well. Uh, g'day. And with the Platinum Lounge as well. So, g'day. Uh, I'm from Bonnie Hills. Anyone been to Bonnie Hills? Oh, we have a hand over here. I see you, brother. Uh, Bonnie Hills is a great part of the world. Uh, when my wife drives to work in the morning, she drives past camels. That's true. We have camels in Australia. In fact, we have more camels than any country in the world. And the camels near where we live are used for tourists to ride on along the beach. Uh, we live in a, a little country town of less than 3,000 people. And that's a privilege. And it's a privilege because we have our family nearby. As the video showed, we have uh, four children. Two of them live uh, within 20 kilometres. And they have given us now three and a half grandchildren. Uh, I don't know if that half will like being called a half. It's just that we haven't met he or her as yet. Uh, we're looking forward to doing that. It's a great privilege uh, to be with you in Dubai. We've never been uh, in this part of the world before, my wife Fiona and I. So it's a, a joy to be with you. And it's a joy to gather together with people who are on about the most important thing in the world. Uh, who are on about God and knowing God. And uh, I want to share with you something of, of my experience of God over the years this morning. Uh, as I, I do that, I, I look around and I, I don't know too many of you personally. Uh, there are one or two faces that uh, I do know, and it's good to connect with you. But most of you, I, I really don't know what your circumstances in life are. Uh, perhaps you've been doing it tough. Uh, maybe there have been struggles and difficulties that you've been facing. Maybe you've had things happen in your life which have caused you to question what life is all about. Uh, that may be true for you if you're a Christian. You've been expecting things to go better than they are going. And maybe you're wondering, where is God? And what's God doing? And is there a point to what you're going through? Uh, maybe you're actually looking into this whole God thing. And you want to know whether there is a plan and a purpose behind life or whether you're just an accident. Well, friends, this, this morning I want to share with you something of a crisis that I experienced. And I believe that God often speaks to us in the midst of a crisis. Uh, the crisis you've heard a little bit about already. Uh, it took place nearly seven years ago. And it wasn't supposed to go that long. Uh, back in 2011, uh, to paint a bit of the backstory, uh, my wife Fiona and our two youngest children had made a decision that we would move from Canberra, which is the capital of Australia, relatively south, right up to Darwin in the north of Australia. Uh, and the reason we were looking to do that is that we actually believed that there was a need for more churches in the north of Australia and that through various experiences that God had given to us, including my wife working in Aboriginal health for about 14 years, uh, we were probably equipped to be able to do that. And so we investigated and we made various plans and we took our family up to Darwin and we explored the idea of planting a new church. And it was coming together really quite well. There are a team of people that were going to be coming with us uh, there are a number from Darwin that were going to be welcoming us and involved in this new church. Uh, my wife had found a job very easily in Indigenous health. My children had enrolled in school and they were about to uh, uh, start up in a new school in Darwin. We'd managed to find a house and we'd actually bought the house. Uh, in Australia, <clears throat> most people, if they're moving for work reasons tend to do that over the summer period, which for us is December, January. And we'd been told that the removalist companies increased their prices by 25 to 30 per cent in December, January. And um, for that reason, we decided that we'd get rid of all of our belongings and we'd move them up to the house uh, back in November before the prices went up. And it was on that last weekend of November, the beginning of December, that we were in the processes of saying goodbye to people. Uh, I was at a conference uh, with a group of 
Christians from around Australia that I met with every year. I'd just given a talk, uh, and uh, it was an opportunity for us to both say goodbye and for people to express some appreciation for the ministry that we'd been doing. Uh, we'd been involved in Canberra for uh, around about 22 years. During that time, we were in ministry in the university, and we had seen a church planted that had grown to close to 1,000 people. And so we were saying goodbye to many of our friends at this time. And uh, I was seated in a coffee shop with a few of these friends that I met with each year. And uh, everyone would spend a little bit of time sharing of their experiences for the year. And then we would pray for each other. And I remember thinking, how come everybody is taking so long to say what they need to say? Um, it just dragged and I found myself getting distracted because the left side of my body was going numb. And I paused and interrupted and said to one of my friends who was there who was a doctor, I don't know what's going wrong, but something is. Now, he organised for us to stop our, our meeting and one of the other guys rushed me to the hospital and uh, he gave instructions, this doctor friend, to the guy driving, that when I got to the emergency department, they were to simply say, query heart attack. Now, I tell you, if you ever have to go to emergency, um, maybe you've tripped over, maybe you've got a bit of a cold, just say, query heart attack, and you get immediate attention. Uh, they let me straight in through the doors and they hooked me up to a heart machine. And, of course, that ECG showed that my heart was running relatively normal. But they were still worried about the symptoms. So they did an X-ray, didn't show anything. And then they took me in for a, a CT scan. And it was the results of the CT scan that were to change our life from that point onwards. And I remember being in the bed and hearing them say, we think you have a tumour. Now, I tell you, at that point, the tear ducts erupted, the knots tied up in my throat. I felt like I'd just received a death sentence. Now, there were some friends who would say I was going through a bit of a midlife crisis. 49 years of age, been involved in work in one place in Canberra, and now uprooting and, and moving, as some people do, in the middle of their lives. But all of a sudden, I was being told it wasn't a midlife crisis, it was an end-of-life crisis, and things went from bad to worse. I didn't know exactly what the implications of being told I had a tumour were until I met with the oncologist a few days later. He said to me, you have lung cancer. And friends, I, I can tell you that didn't make sense. Uh, I, together with I think most of the world, thought that you had to be a smoker to get lung cancer, and I hadn't been a smoker. But you don't have to be a smoker to get lung cancer. You do have to have lungs. Uh, there's not too many people who get it without lungs. Uh, and I was told that my lung cancer had progressed. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the case here in Dubai, but uh, certainly in Australia, if it is just a little tumour and they can cut it out, they'll say, well, that's stage one. You go through stage two, stage three, up to stage four, which means that it's spread to other parts of the body. And he said, you have stage four lung cancer. I asked a question that you shouldn't really uh, ask uh, unless accompanied by people that can help you when you get the answer. But I, I said, what can you do about it? What's the prognosis? And he said to me, it's incurable. Can't cut it out because it's already spread. Radiation therapy is not going to work. We'll, we'll give you some chemotherapy because that will help your symptoms. But... We don't expect to get rid of this cancer. It's terminal. And at that time, I was completely devastated. Now, I spent the next few weeks in hospital. And my health, rather than getting better, actually got worse. All sorts of things stopped working the way they should work. And let me say, if you just want a picture of what this looked like, I went into hospital weighing around about 92 kilos. I came out of hospital weighing around about 77, three weeks later. My body went into shutdown. Painkillers, 
leading to hallucinations. Unable to process food, and so I just started to shed the weight. Uh, I was hooked up to drains to, to remove the fluid that had surrounded my lungs. The symptoms were being caused by a build-up of over two litres of fluid around my left lung. They had to drain that away, but of course the, the uh, cleaner didn't know what the machine was, and she kicked the machine over, and then the nurses didn't know what to do with it, and things just kind of went from bad to worse. And there was one occasion when friends of mine who had driven to see me actually spent some time in the coffee shop with my wife uh, while they were visiting, and she said, I don't know if he's coming out of hospital. Now, friends, just think about this. A few days before, I was on an adventure, right? I was hopefully being used by God, together with my family, to move to the north of Australia and to plant a new church. And then only days later, I'm being told that I'm dying, and I might see the following Christmas. 10 to 13 months. 1% chance of survival in five years. Now, what happens in the midst of such a crisis? And what happens to a Christian? See, I was one who'd put my trust in the Lord Jesus. I made a decision as, as a young boy to follow Jesus. It was a decision that I, I kind of tested and worked through when I went to university. Is there a God? Is there... Jesus, did Jesus die for me? Did he rise again from the dead? You see, I, I'm lying in a hospital bed being told that I don't have a future. Now, I'd been sick before, I'd been injured before, I'd been in hospital before, but, but I always expected to get better, and now the doctors were telling me there is no hope of a cure. It just doesn't exist for your type of cancer. So what hope can I have? Well, as somebody who had spent their life seeking to persuade people of the truth of Christianity, I was now being tested on the very beliefs that I had been preaching to others. If you're going to die soon, Dave, does that mean you have no hope? Or is there a hope that can be found in the Lord Jesus Christ? Is death the end or is there a resurrection? See, if there's no hope of a cure, then the only hope that I had is, in, is the hope of being raised again. Now, I've spent a lot of time over the last few years connecting with people who have cancer. And many of those people hold out a, a deep desire to find a cure, to find another treatment, to find something that will prolong their life. More time with their family. More time enjoying the people around about them. More time. And I'm 100% committed to that. I, I believe it's a right thing to invest in, in good medical care. It's a right thing to provide relational support to people. It's important for people to have reasons to get up in the morning and live their life. But for so many of those people, in situations like mine, their hope is taken away. And friends, I want to share with you the, the, the journey that I went through to find that there is a real hope, a real hope for all eternity in the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been to a lot of funerals. It's, uh, it's one of the sad realities that even over the last few years, having to get to know other people with cancer, that I've sat there saying goodbye to many a friend. And one of the things about funerals is that you never hear anything bad said, do you? I mean, it would be a strange thing to go to a funeral and for someone to get up and say, do you think Uncle Bob was a good bloke? He was awful. Good to see the back of Uncle Bob. You, you just don't get that, right? Um, what you do get is people saying, Uncle Bob is in a better place. Uncle Bob is looking down on you, which is a little bit creepy, really. Um, Uncle Bob is now where he always wanted to be. And I want to say, how do you know? How do you know where Uncle Bob is? You see, when you're on your deathbed, you need a lot more than wishful thinking of hopes that maybe there's a better place for those who've died. And I needed to go back and to ask those questions again. And the key questions that I needed to ask had to do with Jesus. Now, I want to take you back to uh, the part of the Bible that Warwick read for us before. Uh, from 1 Corinthians, 
uh, chapter 15 and verse 14. Because a lot of people believe that religion is just a bunch of ideas. And it doesn't matter what has happened in history or what's happened in life. The ideas of religion are the important thing. But look at this. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote. If Christ has not been raised, by that he means raised from the dead, then our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Can there be a hope for someone with a terminal illness? If there's no medical cure available, can there be a hope for somebody with a terminal illness? Well, friends, I thought that I had been suddenly diagnosed with a terminal illness, but I was wrong. I'd always had that terminal illness. And you know what? Even though I don't know you personally, I do know that you have the same terminal illness. Do you know what the mortality rate is in Australia? Well, it's actually the same as what it is in Dubai. It's 100%. We are all born to die. It's not that suddenly, having found cancer cells in my body, I was now going to die. I was always going to die. And what we need is to realise that ultimate hope will never be found in cure in this life alone. But by being raised from the dead to enjoy relationship with God for all eternity. And if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then we've got absolutely nothing to base our hope on. Some religions are based on writings and ideas, and they have nothing to do with the people who wrote them. But the Christian faith is founded on something that took place in history, not too far from where you and I are at this time, in the Middle East, in Jerusalem, outside Jerusalem, Jesus hung on a cross and on the third day, he rose again from the dead. If that didn't happen, I've got no hope, you've got no hope. But friends, I believe that that hope is real. Ha have a look at what Paul wrote in uh, the beginning of this. Chapter 15. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel the word gospel simply means great news. I want to remind you of the great news that I preached to you and on which you received and have taken your stand. This news is important. By this good news, this great news, this gospel news, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word that I preached to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. If you remember nothing else from this morning... I want you to go away with this good news. And what is this good news? Well, he goes on to explain it. Next verse, verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Here it is. That Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried. What's going on here? The good news... The news that is of first importance is that Christ Jesus died. Now, I don't know any reputable historian in the world that would deny that reality. That Jesus lived and that he died. And there's nothing, nothing at all that's particularly significant about that. Everybody has died. Everybody will die. What's the point that's being made that Jesus died? See what it says? He died. We need to go back a slide. He died for our sins. What is our sin? Our sin is turning our back upon God. Our sin is thinking that we can live without God. Our sin is believing that we matter more than anything else. I met a guy once at university 
who came up to me, knowing that I was a Christian, and said, do you know what I do with God? I said, no. He said, I type the word God onto my computer in the largest font that will fill my screen. And then I hit delete. I thought, you're weird. (laughs) But friends, that's what we do. We delete God from our lives. And it's because of that that we have a terminal illness. It's because we push God out of our lives that we all live under the sentence of death. And not just physical death, but but a spiritual death of being cut off from God forever. Jesus never hit delete. Jesus always lived in relationship with God. Jesus honoured God. He obeyed God. He was in harmony with God. He lived a perfect life. And yet he died on a cross to pay the price, not for his sin, but for yours and for mine. That's the significance of Jesus' death. You know Christians celebrate Easter, right? Christians call the death of the Lord Jesus Good Friday. Ever thought that's a little strange? To celebrate the death of the person that you are putting your trust in, the one who you follow, who you worship, as good? In fact, I don't think it should be called Good Friday at all. I think it should be called Extra Super Special Great Friday because that's the day where he paid for our sin. But more than that, see this, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to people. See, Jesus didn't stay dead. He, He wasn't dying for his own sin. He was dying for yours and for mine. God raised him again to life. And the Bible says that because God raised Jesus to life, there is hope for you and for me that he will raise us to life. I needed to hear this again, friends. When I was facing my impending death, when I was being told that I might not see the following Christmas, it's like plugging that kind of reality of our mortality into an amplifier. I don't know about you, but but I'd been living most of my life up to that point of time as though I was going to live forever. Rarely involved in in situations that would cause me to think, no, my time is up. And, And then all of a sudden, that's what I'm being told. Friends, there is hope of being raised because Jesus was raised. And how do we know that Jesus was raised from the dead? Not wishful thinking, but eyewitnesses. Look at what's said. You can read it there. He was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. That means it was promised. And that he appeared to Cephas. Cephas was another name for Peter. Peter was that number one of his followers, one of the disciples. And and then he appeared to the twelve. These were guys who weren't actually expecting Jesus to be raised from the dead. They were cowering in an upper room, scared of the authorities who'd killed Jesus. And yet on the third day, Jesus rises and he appears to some of them. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. You know, I've heard people say, Jesus wasn't raised. People just thought they saw him. You know, people have hallucinations. People have that kind of thing where you see someone and you think there's someone and you tap them on the shoulder and then you get embarrassed because it's not them. But this is 500 people who saw Jesus at the same time. And then it goes on to say that, that, that most of them are still living. What are the implications of that? See, this is written around about 20 or so years after the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And what it's saying is if, if you don't believe Jesus was raised from the dead, there are people living today who can bear testimony to the reality of that. You could go and ask them. We could bring them into a courtroom and cross-examine them. So this isn't wishful thinking, friends. This is eyewitness testimony. 
And then he, he appeared to James. Who was James? Jesus' brother. You, you can get cases of mistaken identity, can't you? But you normally know your brother. And then he appeared to the apostles. And then, last of all, he appeared to me also. Now, who's the me here? It's the Apostle Paul. It's the Apostle Paul who was traveling down a road to Damascus as a strict Jew who opposed Christians. He believed that Christians were heretics. He believed that they were blaspheming. He believed that they were telling lies about God. See, this guy, whose name used to be Saul, was actually looking to seek out Christians and to put them into prison. Why? Because they were saying that a man was God. More than that, they were saying that a man who was killed, executed on a cross, was God. What an obnoxious thing to say. More than that, they were saying that this man who was killed on a cross has been raised to life and is alive today and rules over this world. Blasphemy, he thought. But friends, on that road to Damascus, he meets the resurrected Lord Jesus. He, he, he's able to be a witness himself. And he discovers that the one who was killed is in fact alive and ruling over all. And the only thing to do at that point is to bow down to seek his forgiveness and to trust in him. Now, friends, I, I don't know your circumstances in life, but I do know that God knows you. He knows every detail. He knows every situation. He knows every thought, every struggle, every pain. He knows your relationships. He knows your sickness. He knows your fears. He knows your dreams and aspirations. God knows you better than you know yourself. And you know what? He knows that you don't measure up. Not, not just don't measure up to God. He knows that you don't even measure up to your own expectations. If we're honest, it's true, isn't it? If we kind of look into our own hearts and we think, I'm so disappointed in myself. I don't do the things I should do. I, I do things I know are completely wrong. I cover them up. I make a mess of everything. How can there be hope for a person like me? One day, one day I will die and I'll stand before God. And, and God will say something to me like, why should I let you into my heaven? Why should you come into my presence? And friends, it, there is every reason to fear that day if you're honest about what you're like. But there is hope. There is a real and certain hope. Because God so loved you that he sent his son to die to pay for your sin. To cancel that debt. To clean away that muck. To take away your guilt. To offer you forgiveness. So that as you stand before God on that day and, and he might say to you, why should I let you in? That you can say to him, there is no reason, God, there is no reason to let me in other than that you sent Jesus to die for me and you raised him to life and I'm trusting in him. And I want to say to you this morning, what do you want to be doing on that day? Do you want to be making up excuses? Do you want to be parading your best behavior? Do you want to be offering your re religious performance? Or do you want to be saying, God, I thank you for Jesus
Friends, so many of us have hopes and dreams and aspirations and desires that are simply too small. Maybe we want that perfect relationship. Maybe we want to make more money. Maybe we'd like to succeed in our career. Maybe there are things we'd like to buy for ourselves. Maybe we'd just like to, 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 to not live under the constant stress and pain of this life. But I want to say to you, God has a far greater plan and purpose for you. And that is that you might know him and spend eternity with him. And if you've not come to the point in your life where you have said to God, I'm I'm sorry, I'm sorry for not treating you as God. If you've not come to the point of, of, of thanking God for Jesus and what he's done. If you've not asked God to be at work within you and changing you, today would be a great day to do that. And in a minute I'm going to pray that God might work in us to that purpose. Friends, one of the things that I hear from time to time, and to a little extent I've struggled with myself, is how can it be that God would allow the suffering of cancer, terminal cancer in people's lives? And, And yes, I'm still here, and I praise God for the time that he's given me. But I've also said goodbye to so many, even Christian people. And God has taken them home. I I tell you, I thought that the will of God in our life was that we would start again and plant a new church in Darwin. But in God's plans and purposes, it was something else. Do you know that in Australia, one in two people will have cancer by the time they're 85? That's half the Australian population. I thought that God had a a ministry in mind for me and for my family to be reaching out to people in the city and the region of northern Australia. But as it turned out, God had a different plan. He he had a plan that that we might reach out to men and women and, and children who were going through the grief and the pain and the suffering and the fear associated with terminal cancer. And I reckon if God had said to me, Dave, I've got a job for you. I want you to reach out to half the Australian population um, because half of them are going to get cancer. And if you're going to be able to do that, you need some credibility. So let's give you cancer. And not one of those ones that everyone knows you're going to get fixed by, but one of the ones that's actually got the highest mortality rate. And one of the ones that people associate with smoking, and so they blame you for it. And let's make it stage four so that there's not actually any hope of a cure. And then you can reach out to people with cancer. I'd say, God, you got the wrong guy. It was Warwick that you needed. (laughs) Actually, I wouldn't wish that on Warwick. Not on his birthday. But friends, God is at work through suffering. Who do we follow, Christian? Who do we follow? Jesus, isn't it? What happened to Jesus? Well, God's plan and purpose for Jesus was that he would be rejected, he would be tortured. He would be crucified. Why would we think that our life wouldn't experience suffering when for the Lord Jesus himself, that's where it took him. And we are Christ followers. And as it was for Jesus, so through death he is raised to life and to glory. So as we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we too will be raised to life and to glory with God. If you want to take hold of that, then I'm going to lead in a prayer now, and you might like to pray with me. Let's talk to God. Our Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that we don't deserve your love. 
We have no reason to expect you to be kind and generous to us. But you have been. We ask you to forgive us for our sin, for our rebellion against you. We ask you to be merciful to us and not treat us as our sins deserve. We thank you that you've sent Jesus to die in our place, to take the punishment for our sin and rebellion. We thank you that Jesus was willing to pay the ultimate cost of death and separation for our sakes, for our forgiveness, for our life. And we thank you that you raised him to life to give us hope for all eternity. Heavenly Father, please enable us to trust in Jesus. Please change our hearts that we might live with Jesus as the ruler in our life. Please change us and transform us in this new life. Amen.